Okay, then we'll get started. Um, uh, so welcome everyone again to the training rounds today. Um, first up, we have Christina Kupferschmidt, uh, who's a PhD student in the School of Engineering at the University of Guelph and the Vector Institute. And her project is on back to the building blocks, designing human-centric AI through health-centric for health through data-centric practices. And Christina is a PhD student at the University of Guelph and the Vector Institute for Artificial Intelligence, where her research is focused on the intersection of machine learning and health. She earned her uh, bachelor's in biomedical engineering from the University of Guelph and holds a master's in rehabilitation medicine from the University of Alberta. Christina's interests lie in responsible AI deployment, human-centered design, and improving the practical application of machine learning technologies in the field of health. Please go ahead whenever you're ready. Perfect, thank you for the introduction. So as mentioned, my name is Christina Cooper-Schmidt. I'm really excited to be here today. So my training to AI was a little bit, I'd say, unconventional, that I have a lot of experience with human-centered design. So I really am eager to kind of put that into practice um, in the field of AI. I'm very interested to hear your thoughts from a clinical perspective on this new line of work that we're conducting. So this is like a very early stage kind of pitch of our research um, and a new idea that we're following through with. So as mentioned, the title is Back to the Building Blocks, Designing Human-Centric AI Through Data-Centric Practices. Oh, sorry. Um, okay, so as a full disclosure, many of the images used in this presentation were AI generated. So really, what is human-centric AI? And I think this is described really well by Fifi Lee, who's a very prominent researcher in responsible AI. So we can't control something so diffuse, but there's much we can do to guide it responsibly. This is why the next frontier in AI cannot simply be technological. It must be humanistic as well. Um, and we're working in AI in a really exciting time. There's really rapid advances, but really I think the humanistic side is super important and needs to catch up as well. So Stanford is a leading center on uh, responsible AI and human-centered AI, um, and have kind of defined these three guiding principles. So the first is that AI should attempt to reflect the depth characterized by human intelligence. The second is that AI should improve human capabilities rather than replace them. And the third is that research should also focus on AI's impact on humans and the people actually using it. So human Centric AI is like a big umbrella term that there are many of different areas that kind of fall underneath it. Um, but today I'll be focusing on three. So the first is fairness, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of. So really understanding will the AI work well in all scenarios? Um, are there underlying biases in the data that kind of um, have the potential to perform these harmful outputs? The second is explainability. So really trying to understand why did the AI make this prediction? Um, and ultimately, how can I trust the model predictions if I don't understand how they're being made? And the third is usability. There's a lots of different ways of describing this, but ultimately, does the tool predict what I actually need it to? And how does this tool impact my workflow? So as we have kind of this discussion around human-centric AI, there's also this emerging conversation around data-centric AI. Um, and another prominent researcher named Andrew Ng um, describes it as the discipline of systematically engineering the data to build a successful AI system. So just recently, we've been living through the rise of foundation models, and these are the tools that kind of power um, exciting new ventures like ChatGPT. But a key piece of what makes foundation models so special is the really, really large scale in which they operate. So they have many orders of magnitude, uh, more parameters than previous deep learning techniques. So this scale really allows for something called homogenization. So this is where a single model can perform well for a wide variety of tasks. Um, but really, how do these work? So foundation models depend on a process known as self-supervised learning, but they do it at a very, very large scale. So self-supervised learning involves taking unlabeled data, which is much easier to access than labeled data, to train a model to complete a proxy task. So I think the most intuitive way of explaining this is by using a kind, the kind of original self-supervised technique, which is rotation. So you can see in this image, we have a digital histopathology image where we have like a, an original. It's then rotated by 90, 180, or 270 degrees. And then the model's task is to predict which of those rotations was applied. 
Um, typically, people aren't using the rotation self-supervised task anymore. I mean, a really popular one that's emerged is called the masked autoencoder. Um, in really simplified terms, what it does is it splits the image into patches. It then masks the patches, and the model is tasked with reconstructing the original image. So after a model has been pre-trained with self-supervised learning, foundation models use something called transfer learning at a large scale. So this means that it uses the weights from the self-supervised task and initializes it for a downstream tasks. This allows for models to be fine-tuned um, to very specialized uh, predictions. And um, I think it's really nice that sometimes people equate self-supervised learning to learning how to see or a baby learning how to recognize colors and shapes. So it's really kind of building this foundation of how to extract um, information from images, but without training on a very specific task. So as previously mentioned, foundation models have a huge reliance on a ton of training data. Um, and I think this raises a really important question of is more data always better? Um, if only optimizing for accuracy, the answer may actually be yes. Um, foundation models have achieved state-of-the-art on many different benchmark set, uh, data sets, but really, um, in the real world, things are much more complicated. You can't just optimize for accuracy. Um, instead, there are some times that maybe less data could be better. So, for instance, clinicians being able um, for clinicians to be able to use these tools, they might require improved transparency to help understand why. Um, they may also feel that models trained on like not specific data may be incapable of recognizing the nuances for a very specific problem. And really, it's very difficult to understand the limitations and how these models could fail, um, which makes it difficult to make sure you're deploying it safely and responsibly. So how can we build trust in using these models in healthcare? Um, I went to a really interesting talk that somebody kind of brought up this concept of in like clinical trial design, they have kind of these concepts that you can always refer to before you use a drug or an intervention. Um, so we've kind of been motivated by that. So by building on elements of clinical trial design, we feel like maybe we can address this. So the first two elements that we're kind of considering are inclusion and exclusion criteria. So really understanding the composition of the cohort and its relationship to the target task. Um, and the second idea would be kind of really calibrating the expectations and limitations. So calibrating performance expectations, knowing how a device should be used, and also really understanding the contraindications of when it should not be used. So this brings me kind of to our research question, which is, can we use expert-defined concepts to first describe the data set composition? So if we created some kind of user interface that clinicians can use to explore the representation of expert-defined concepts in training data, um, and secondly, in situations that they do feel like they need more domain-specific data, we could use this to curate more specific data sets and optimize the likelihood that the model will translate well to the target task and also build confidence in the people using it. So this builds heavily on a, an idea that was presented by Bean Kim um, in 2018 called the concept activation vector, and I'll call them CAVs in this presentation. So CAVs are really a method. Um, they're an explainable AI method for producing global explanations. So you can understand them as for any given concept, the CAV measures the influence of that concept on the model's prediction. Um, so Google has a very nice image here that they uh, trained a binary classifier to take in images, predict if the image contains a doctor or not a doctor, and they tested some human concepts such as white coat, stethoscope, and male. Um, they found that white coat was the most important um, concept, stethoscope was the second most important, and male was the third that they tested. So really, it can help you to understand the concepts that are being used to make the predictions, but it can also really outline some, un some biases that exist in the data. Um, so how do CAVs work? Um, we first start by identifying a concept that may or may not be directly present in the training data but really it's relevant to the human's understanding of the task. So for example, um, I have my image over here. You could define the concept as stripes. You could define the concepts as uh, spots, um, but it should be something human understandable. Um, the uh, next part is to train a binary linear classifier to differentiate between positive and negative examples. And finally, um, sorry, can you guys see yourselves on the screen as well? 
Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Um, measure the conceptual sensitivity across inputs of supervised tasks. So this would involve taking the inputs and seeing how the neurons respond to the specific uh, concepts that you've defined and really understanding how heavily those have been weighted. So our approach is kind of a, a two-stage approach. So in the beginning, we would do the CAV identification. So we would choose human understandable concepts to study. We would then train the concept activation vectors by presenting positive and negative examples. And finally, in this stage, we would extract the sensitivity to these CAVs from the data used for self-supervised pre-training. The second stage would actually involve kind of using these CAVs for exploration and future steps. So you would have the CAV exploration phase that we can improve interpretability to understand if similar uh, examples actually exist in the self-supervised training data set. And finally, if we feel like an incorrect proportion of the examples are not useful, um, we can curate a new data set. So stage one, identifying meaningful CAVs. So the first step we would, um, would be identifying the concepts that we'd actually like to explore. So we see this as something that could be entirely humanly driven. So you would have experts like yourselves defining them. It could be entirely automatic. So extracting these from clinical notes or metadata or really a combination of the two. So in this example, I highlight uh, three presentations in chest, chest x-rays that were derived automatically from clinical notes. So I picked effusion, infiltration, and nodules. Um, next, we would train the calves. So we would provide positive examples. So examples that do demonstrate the concept. So in this case, I've chosen effusion as my concept. Um, and then negative examples would be examples that do not de demonstrate that concept. Um, so no effusion. And you can see here I have n equals 10 because it actually requires a very small number of examples to be able to train this classifier. Um, so once the calves are computed, they provide insights into which neurons are the most sensitive to specific components. So positive calves would indicate neurons are more activated by the concept, while negative calves would indicate the opposite. Um, and so from this, we would take the embeddings and extract out the CAV sensitivity for each example. Um, and then we can move on to stage two, where we explore the impacts of CAVs in self-supervised training data. So previous work by Kai et al. in 2019 um, presented Smiley, which is a, uh, it's a, a user interface for content-based image retrieval and digital histopathology. So you can see here, they've kind of brought in this idea of having a slider bar for different concepts, and it would bring forward unlabeled examples that are the most similar. So we're building on this by really focusing on creating a quantitative description of how many training examples are actually related to specific concepts um, in these really large data sets used for self-supervised pre-training. Um, and ultimately, this involves some kind of validation study in the future. So do examples with high CAV sensitivity actually align well with what's represented in clinical notes and ensuring that this, uh, this like translates well to the self-supervised setting um, as it is quite dependent on the self-supervised task that's chosen. So let's say you complete your exploration and you determine that there's a very low proportion of examples um, that are representing the specific concept that you want to look at. So in our example, that would be a fusion in chest x-rays. Um, so we then propose that you could define a CAV sensitivity threshold and use this to, uh, to curate a new data set and repeat self-supervised pre-training. So ultimately, the hope is for your very specific task, the performance between the curated data set and the original data set would be the same, but you would have less training data to do it, and you would be able to understand the composition of the training data much better. So as far as the contributions and novelty kind of of our proposed line of work, the first would be kind of using this automatic extraction of concepts for calves or this hybrid approach that we're able to automatically extract them from clinical notes, um, present this to the clinician, and they could decide if these are the concepts they want to use. The second would be combining data and human-centric approaches. And the third is um, looking at applying CAVs to self-supervised learning and foundation models, as they are very prominent these days and going to continue to be more prominent. 
So in conclusion, um, like I said, I think we really need to focus on finding ways of harnessing self-supervised learning and foundation models in safe and trustworthy ways for health. I think they hold a huge amount of promise, but I know that there's a lot of apprehension to their use. Um, and ultimately, what we want to do is we want to reduce the translation gaps. So a lot of the time in research, we see these advancements are working in benchmark data sets, they're working, but they're really not being adopted into clinical workflows because of a lot of different barriers that exist. And finally, I think there's kind of this complementary nature that we envision these models being both human and data centric. Um, so thank you very much for your time. I'm very eager to hear if you guys have any feedback, comments, um, specifically if you have any use cases, I think it would be really interesting to hear your perspectives. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions for Christina? I think I saw a hand. Uh, yeah, I'll just go ahead. Hey, Christina, great presentation. Um, I'm a PhD student in the Department of Computer Science here. I also work in machine learning, but um, less from the human-centric AI side, more of just like the, the boring machine learning stuff. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed your talk and I just had a few questions I had for you. So yep. one, it's it's really cool how you mentioned how you can identify these, these calves in this very unsupervised way. But and you kind of alluded to this, but how do you evaluate them and how do you validate that you're getting the correct kind of concepts? Um, to me, yeah. it seems like it's a very labor intensive process. And do you have any ideas for how to make that easier? So I actually think this is this is a great question. I think it kind of builds on um, I'm just gonna try and go back to a slide. So I mentioned that part of the novelty was the automatic extraction of concepts for calves. So I think the first way that we would do this evaluation is um, some of the, so I know there are groups at Vector that are working on actually creating foundation models for, for medical imaging specifically, and they have associated clinical notes with them. So we would use some kind of LLM based keyword extractor um, to try and validate that the concepts are actually present um, rather than doing like a qualitative assessment at the at least at the early stages um, for experimentation, because I think it is really time time sensitive. And our original step is also to test this in natural images. So a non-expert would also be able to kind of evaluate um, the ability to extract these calves. So we would have kind of a natural image stream as well as a medical image. Um, but that's our first kind of directions. Cool. And so if you, do you think it makes more sense to have a preconceived notion of what calves the should be identified and then evaluate them afterwards or just see what the model spins up and then evaluate them kind of retrospectively do you think there's a better or worse way to do that mm, i think there i think they would be complementary to one another so i feel like there's like this um i'm really interested in kind of this idea of like integrating domain knowledge into machine learning so especially if you have let's say I was working on chest x-rays and I had um, some radiologists working on the team that would be willing to collaborate with me, if they would be willing to identify concepts, I think having like one stream of experimentation with expert defined concepts and one that's automatically extracted from clinical notes, I think that would be very interesting to see if you see alignment between those two. Um, because I, I really think they, they may not show the exact same thing. Um, yeah. Cool. And my last question I have for you. So the Google example that you gave was interesting because um, uh, it's a 34% um, of the weight was given towards the fact that the doctor was a man. Yeah. Um, so how do you reduce the biasness um, of calves or problematic calves? How do you like encourage the calves that you identify to be, um, to not kind of encode the biases that exist? So I think the best way of tackling that problem would probably be to adjust the training data set that's being used for the classification task. So if let's say in like the first round you identified something problematic like that, it would be a, a very clear indication that you need to curate a new data set that is more balanced um, for, for those specific um, groups. And it could also be, so in some situations there's just not data, like it's like we know these models are biased, there is not data to create a balanced data set. So that would be where the contraindications piece comes in so that you would very clearly say to the clinician, this is uh, a limitation of the model. 
Um, and you need to understand that if you're using this in your decision-making workflow um, so that they should even know not like to discredit the model's output or not place as much trust in it. So it's kind of like this back and forth interaction between the clinician and the AI system, if that makes sense. Yep, cool, thank you so much. No problem, thank you, great questions. Anyone else have any questions? Uh, I have a quick question, Christina. Um, yeah. I was wondering limitations wise, um, and, and I feel like there's different areas where there could be limitations. What are some limitations for concept um, uh, activation vectors? So one major limitation is if you feed in there, if you feed in like, so where I described the positive, I'm just gonna pull up this slide on the positive and negative examples um, here. So if you feed in positive or negative examples um, that are not exclusively representative, um, it will still output a cat. So you need to make sure that you're really doing like quality control on your, on your inputs for this stage. I also think something that's very interesting in the medical space is like this idea of co-occurrence. So let's say um, you had a fusion and infiltration in the chest X-ray. Um, and these two occurred commonly together, you would probably have some kind of correlative effect of that. So I think that is also like a very important piece to consider as you're, as you're uh, demonstrating kind of these positive and negative examples. And also if you know that there's like common co-occurrences that exist, it probably makes sense to also train calves on those to see if you're able to differentiate between the two. Um, and I think that would be very important in an experimentation setting. But I think um, those are that is like a big limitation. Another one that I've also outlined is um, for self-supervised learning. There, like as I mentioned, there's many different techniques of about going of how to go about it. Um, and I think that this could really impact what the the outputs you see. So you could see really inconsistent results across different self-supervised tasks because essentially the objective is just different of what it's trying to classify in an unsupervised way. So I think it would have to be evaluated across several different self-supervised tasks to get any kind of like understanding about generalizability um, before it was actually deployed. So it's important, I think, to look at, especially if we do want to expand it to kind of these foundation models, to evaluate it in the self-supervised tasks that are being used currently. So it might be something that has to continually be um, validated that it's working. And there's two more questions in the chat. Um, so one of them is the, uh, this is very interesting, Phil, this is very interesting. Uh, do you have any more papers that could explain this more in detail? Uh, I'm assuming talking about CABS. Um, but uh, yeah, do you have any? Yeah, so the the Bean Kim paper, the CAV paper, I think I have it in my references here, but I can also share it with the chat in a second. Um, but you can write it down. This paper right here, Interpretability Beyond Feature Attribution. It's actually, I would say, like very accessible for a machine learning paper. Um, ever since I've seen the idea of CAVs, I kind of feel like it's like this underappreciated machine learning thing because to non-machine learning experts, I feel like it's very tangible and understandable. Um, so I can definitely, I'd be happy to share some resources on, um, on CAVs. The Smiley paper uh, from Google is also great. And that was written for a like human computer interaction audience. So it's very accessible as well. And then we have one more question. Uh, is CAVs specifically geared towards computer vision applications or can the concept be used for free text uh, applications like medical notes, et cetera? Yeah, so there's no specific reason that it does have to be limited to computer vision applications. Um, it just needs an embedding um, and some kind of convolutional network. So it is just, I would say, been most prominently used in the computer vision space, but there is no, like, there's no explicit reason why. Perfect. And then I have another question. I was wondering... Okay how you generated some of the images, uh, the AI generated images. You know what, I actually, I uh, I used the Canva AI generator, but I've been, um, 
I I took a prompt engineering course with Vector, so I feel like I've had like a, a lot of experience crafting prompts now to strategically make what I want. But it's it's actually like quite a fun um thing to be able to include images in your in your presentation that are topical but also like visually interesting. Yeah. Thank Would you. highly recommend. Yeah. Um think that uh, does anyone have, have any questions or I think I saw maybe someone raise raise their hand Conrad Samsel are you raising your hand yes sorry about that um thank you for the presentation and it'll be interesting to see how this implementation of calves in medical AI will kind of impact um like clinician on like, like autonomy um and decision making um so I did have one question um and this was in regards to one of the limitations discussed. So um, if there's a feature, let's say, which does not exist, or if there's a feature which exists on a spectrum, which is not binary, um, are there any specific considerations or limitations in regards to that? Like, would we have to decide um, some sort of cutoff for those, um, like, so for those classifications? I think as long as you had some kind of, like, most most positive and most negative example, like, if you could capture the entire spectrum and you had examples that could somehow define that. Um, I think that it would actually work quite well still. Like, I think this reminds me very much of um, the Google Smiley thing is actually very, very interesting. That so in the center, you would have, you could have it essentially be centered for like somewhere in the middle of the scale. Um, and the positive would be like the most extreme example and the negative would be the most the most negative example. So I think this could blend quite nicely to things that you do see on an on a spectrum. Um, but I think it would be something worth exploring. Um, like it, if you could somehow get concrete like labels or data that say like extreme case, slight case. Um, but I think it could be a very cool direction. Thanks for the question. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions? If not, thank you again, Christina, for the presentation. Yeah, my pleasure. If anyone, um, I, I will uh, quickly drop the references that I think are most relevant in the chat, but if anyone has any follow-up questions, please feel free to send me an email. Perfect. And um, we'll get started with the next presentation. If uh, really you'd like to share your slides, I'll just introduce you. I don't think we can see, you see my slides and hear me okay. Yeah, perfect. Yep. Um, great. Okay. So our next presentation uh, will be given by Min Li Chen, who's a master's student in medical biophysics in the Temerty Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto. And her projects on the utilization of unsupervised image feature-based clustering to scale classifier design in histopathology. Uh, Ms. Chen is working towards a Master of Science in Medical Biophysics at the University of Toronto. She holds an Honours Bachelor of Science from the University of Calgary with a specialization in biochemistry. During her undergrad studies, uh, Chen was involved with biophysics research on light spectrum analysis from gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria. And for her, uh, for her master's, she branched out to digital pathology and is passionate about combining AI knowledge to solve real-world pathology problems and scaling the computational pathology toolbox to meet the collective needs and interests. Please go ahead whenever you're ready. Hi everyone, um, my name is Min Lee and uh, I'm a master's student in uh, Dr. Diamandis' lab. I'm very glad to be here to present my project. Um, and the, the, my project is utilization of calcifiers and image feature-based clustering to scale classifier design in this um, pathology. And, uh, to begin the talk, before I dive into the details of the project, I'd like to briefly introduce where pathologies stand in the diagnostic workflow of medicine 
There are many layers of modern medicine that require uh, pattern recognition tasks. From the simple visual and subjective recognition of a skin lesion, a tumor in the image, to the quantitative objective results from molecular testing. Um, the qualitative measurements are often done at the bedside in a matter of minutes, while the quantitative molecular testing are done in separate labs. This test can take up to weeks and can be more expensive. And traditional pathology lies somewhere in the middle of the spectrum, where pathologists would recognize cellular patterns that are marked by H and E and IHC stains under a microscope. Uh, but there are also quantitative uh, diagnosis process associated with pathology. So it's a, it's kind of a perfect balance in the middle, and it both has point of care, qualitative measurements, and also quantitative care. And so it's a, it's an important field that we want to uh, further explore. So more recently, a technology named post slide imaging allowed the observation of such pathological patterns to be digitized, and thus allowing more integration of uh, sophisticated computational image analysis tools to be used. And I would like to introduce our workflow by beginning with introducing convolutional neural network. To put it simply, convolutional neural network is a type of artificial neural network that specializes in spatial pattern recognition, um, which makes it ideal for the type of image analysis we need. It's similar to biological neural network in that it contains nodes similar to neurons that can receive input signal and output signal. Uh, they contain input layer that brings the initial data into the system for further processing by subsequent layers, and the eye that receives input visual signals and relay it to the brain. The hidden layers are made of mathematical functions, each designed to produce an output specific to an intended result. The hidden layers can recognize patterns such as edges, shapes, and specific objects. This process is like the brain processing the visual information. And the output layer contain, uh, combines and flattens the information from the hidden layers and generates the results that is a desired outcome, similar to the brain finally coming to a conclusion with the visual information. The convolutional neural network can be trained to learn to recognize new objects, much like how a newborn baby first learned to recognize different objects in the world. Now, similar to the general workflow shown previously, we can input pathological images with different patterns into the neural network to train the network and allow it to learn histological patterns. Each full slide image is broken down into square tiles, and each tile uh, can be given a label. In this example, the particular pattern shown in this image is labeled glioblastoma. And the scene alerts, alerts from the labels given on the training images over time, and the testing images then put into the trained scene, and the probability score will be given on the most, type, most likely type of tumor. So the trained CN then also gives a heat map of the breakdown of different tissue regions and allows us to not only see tumor region, but also other types of tissue regions on the slide. Now, most computational pathology tools try to solve context-specific problems and does not incorporate multiple histopathological outputs for systematic evaluation. Therefore, they often only provide partial solutions. For example, in this instance, a specific classifier was developed to look at lung cancer subtypes, lung adrenal carcinoma and lung squamous cell carcinoma. However, it doesn't provide information about other aspects, such as quantifying necrosis in hematotic activity, and this would require a separate classifier. On the other hand, in, uh, the limitation in available resources in computational pathology also lies in the fact that uh, clinicians with valuable histological expertise often don't have the core expertise in computational algorithm due to the limitation in uh, computational experience. So, in addition, uh, in the development of this kind of tools, annotation of individual cells uh, can often uh, often required, and uh, this can be laborious and time consuming. In order to solve the above problems, we've developed an image feature based uh, clustering tool that can be used to scale production of pathologist uh, pathology classifiers, in where pathologists can be involved in the process of developing classifiers easily with the involvement of batch annotation instead of individual cell annotation. And there are two parts to uh, this uh, process. The first is that we've uh, taken a prototype and uh, looked to see if it can be generalized, it can be applied to various organ tumor samples. So I will begin to explain the image feature-based clustering tool by first explaining how the tissue heterogeneity map is generated. 
um, the full slide image is put into the CNN, which extracts 512 deep learning feature vectors and clusters them together based on the commonly shared morphological patterns. And this is done for the whole tissue sample on the microscopic slide and allowing us to see a spatial map of how the tissues are clustered on a slide level. We're also able to generate a class for each region based on these histomorphological patterns. This pipeline can also be used to select regions of interest in molecular testing. And it's powerful in that it will allow a large region to cluster together and allow for mass annotation of hundreds and thousands of slides. And beyond the field deep learning feature vectors mentioned uh, in the previous slide, are quantitative measurements of pathological patterns. This deep learning in, uh, engineered features it can be correlated with common pathological patterns such as mucin and epithelium. On the right is an example of a particular deep learning feature. You can see that a high score in this uh, feature represents a different morphology pattern than a low score. And in this particular feature, it represents a different mucin correlation. This is an example output on the liver cancer that is generated by our pipeline. In order to understand how the clusters were formed, um, an external nuclei segmentation tool called Habernet is also applied to the color uh, clusters, and uh, this provides a quantitative measurement of the region heterogeneity. In figure A, uh, this is a regular HNE stained image uh, that's digitized with a whole slide image. And figure B represents a tumor heterogeneity map generated using the feature based uh, tile clustering. And figure C represents a cellular composition graph. Of this a particular image gen generated by nuclear segmentation. And this difference, uh, and in figure D, we also see a visual uh, representation of the different color regions. Um, the blue, green, or yellow represents the color clustered regions from uh, figure D. And the uh, colored circle or the colored segmentation represents uh, the type of cells. Red represents a neoplastic cell, green represents connective tissue, and uh, yellow re represents inflammatory. So the difference in this case um, is pretty profound in the blue versus yellow color clustered region. Where it's clear that the blue region is many neoplastic cells is labeled in red, uh, in the red segmentation. And um, while the yellow region have a lot of connective tissue and inflammatory cells as shown by the yellow and green uh, circles. The difference is also visible on figure C where uh, the cellular composition is available where the blue is mainly composed of neoplastic cell while yellow is inflammatory and connected. And this is another example down on a different tumor. This is a lymphoid neoplasm that used large B cell lymphoma where um, we can see uh, pretty clearly in the red clustered region and the green clustered region, the, there's a large morphological difference uh, enhanced by uh, the identification of different nuclei. The red, uh, in the red clustered region, there's uh, normal inflammatory cells or lympho normal lymphocytes, while in green, it's um, neoplastic lymphocytes circled by red uh, that signifies neoplastic cell. This uh, difference is also visible on the cellular composition graph where we see a relatively large uh, quantity of uh, inflammatory cell in the red bar and um, a large quantity of neoplastic cells in the green bar. And uh, this, uh, this uh, and every cancer types, they can be different in their uh, morphology and there's different types of tumor heterogeneity. So we applied this method to um, various of, of various of cancer types in uh, the TCGA database. And we have examples like kidney, uterus, cervix, lung, lymphoid, and pancreas, and we're working on applying it to uh, the rest of the TCGA cases. And so in summary, uh, for part one, we've developed an image-based feature clustering tool capable of generating unsupervised readouts of tissue heterogeneity maps that allows generalizability to various organ tissue types. And uh, moving on to the second part, we'll be using this uh, a workflow to um, train, uh, annotate tissues and train classifiers. The following workflow will be used to train a classifier based on the output of clustering. A pathologist will start annotation by selecting the cohort of the, that he would like to uh, train the classifier. And each of the training slide will then be delineated based on their, spe their special morphological patterns in, in different colored regions. 
pathologists will then annotate selective uh, tissue patterns with their own expertise. And all the annotations will be um, aggregated together and the CNN then will be trained based on the annotation. Once the new AI model is trained and, val and validated, it will be hosted on pathology report AI, a cloud platform for community sharing, which will allow other pathologists in the same field to use such tool. And uh, this is an example from a colorectal cancer classifier developed completely remotely uh, with a pathologist in Saudi Arabia, Dr. Mohammed Al Yusuf. And I will use this as an example to get more into the details of uh, specific classifiers. And on this slide, you can see um, it contains a special morphology uh, related to colorectal cancer. The colorectal cancer classifier, it contains uh, epithelial mucin a neoplastic epithelial pattern specific for colorectal cancer. And uh, the overall performance of this classifier is good with 79.85% uh, of uh, the testing tiles predicted to in all classes, the confusion matrix. A true label in this case will be pathologist annotation and, and the uh, predicted label will be computer generated um, prediction. In this workflow, the user often has to revisit the initial version and add additional annotation or detail to the classifier. The revised version has more specific classes, such as edge of tumor mixed with inflammatory cell and mucin patterns. Um, accurate hemorrhage, for example, uh, significantly improved from 70% of slide predicted true to 95%. Similarly, connective tissue improved from 72% to 89%. Epithelial pattern improved from 69% to 94%, and smooth muscle improved from 76 to 89%. We're seeing a clear increase in the performance of the model uh, as it learns with additional of more annotated slides as well as corrective performances. Uh, in addition to the ones showed, we've completed six classifiers and have 12 classifiers under development will soon be hosted on our website for various organs and purposes ranging from the general tumor, non-tumor classifiers for the liver, ovaries, and colorectal to the more specific classifiers, such as tumor subtyping classifier for different kinds of uh, kidney uh, tumors, and uh, more specifically, um, predicting levels of ABCC2 gene expression in kidney, in, in kidney tumor. And so um, this is a, a powerful database uh, that is available online that people can uh, test out once you have a full slide image, and you can also uh, build your own classifier. Um, if you have the ex pathology expertise, you can annotate it and design your own classifier that's used for your own um, research or clinical purposes. And here is a crowdsourcing platform. If you have pathology expertise and you would like to try out the classifier, other pathologists have built or would like to build your own classifier, by all means, you can uh, use the link on the top of the slide, or you can use the QR code at the right uh, bottom corner. And here are the interface of selecting other people's classifiers, where you will be able to see the classes that are used in the particular classifier and upload your own slide to test out the predictions. If you have your own local cases and would like to build your own classifier, you can choose to create button under my models and upload a slide to add to your list and request a model um, that you would like to train based on your own uh, local cases. So we're looking to build a knowledge base like that of Wikipedia, where the data are collected internationally with, and with people contributing instead of a, a localized, slower, slower version of knowledge compilation like that of uh, the book version of the Britannica. And so to summarize part two, uh, we've built an uh, image, ba image feature-based clusters that can be easily incorporated into the classifier training process. And these classifiers are collected, uh, collected on a cloud-based platform that enables people to use internationally and train classifier of their own interest. And the significance of this project is that the image feature-based clustering can be applied to various organ and utilized in batch annotation of organ-specific classifiers. And this workflow allows for incorporation of pathologists with no computational expertise to become involved in the production of training pathologists. It also allows for rapid scaling of a pathology tool development to address our answer tasks and eventually 
push for adoption of uh, computational pathology into clinical practice. And lastly, I would like to thank my supervisor, Dr. Diamandis, my lab members, our data sources, prospective cases from University Health Network, Rich and Cancer Biobank, and external collaborators. I would also like to thank my supervisor committee, uh, Dr. Diamandis, Dr. Martel, and Dr. Dunn. And uh, I would think, I'd like to thank Keith Curran for giving me this, this opportunity to present as well. And finally, we have our QR code for our website on the last slide. If you're interested in trying it out again, please, uh, by all means. And thank you for listening, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Emily. <clears throat> uh, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to raise your hand or uh, drop some questions in the chat. And uh, Sujay? Yeah, a uh, great presentation. Um, I just had one question. So I think you had a slide about um, getting annotations from pathologists, and then you mentioned that you're going to merge all the annotations together. Do you mind mm -hmm. just going back to that slide really quickly? Yeah, this one. So I'm curious, like, if you have multiple pathologists labeling the same tissue, I know there can be kind of inter-rater variability, like different pathologists might have different opinions and interpretations of different slides. Um, so how would you merge annotations when the annotations might be conflicting? Right now, in most cases, uh, there's only one pathologist working on an individual organ uh, classifier. But um, I would think that, um, so the idea right now for us is that um, if there are multiple pathologists that would like to develop the classifier for the same organ, we would like to um, allow them to each develop their own and then we'd, we would put it on the website and we have a rating system on the website and we would allow other pathologists to try to use and test out their classifier and see if uh, which one is more accurate through like making adjustment or like validating through uh, other people's usage. Hmm. Cool, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I have a quick question, Minley. I was wondering uh, with your custom uh, cohort selection, uh, so you had 2,867 whole slide images and you went down to 58. Um, mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could go more into detail about how that was done specifically. Oh, yeah. So um, it was a more arbitrary number. It was an arbitrary number selected to demonstrate the process. It wasn't like um, from an actual example. So what that demonstrates uh, in reality is just um, they, them selecting from a large uh, pathology slide database um, whichever slides that suit their own needs. Like for example, some of them would like to um, go into more detail, like uh, going into detail about uh, cancer subtyping. For example, we have a liver pathologist. They should like to look at metastatic uh, tumor samples. And so she would select specifically the uh, liver slide that has metastatic uh, patterns. And she would also select some uh, cold some other colorectal cancer slides that may have also metastatic slide to combine together to make a classifier of her own needs. So it's very um, pathology specific and uh, it's uh, specific to the development of each, um, each uh, classifier. So that was the arbitrary number. It wasn't meant to be like a, a reality, realistic example. Got it, thank you. And uh, we have a question in the chat um crowd uh crowdsourcing seems to be a great way to make models available for public use from what i understand uh, pathology reports that ai host classifiers that were developed by international parties did you face difficulties in getting authors to collaborate with you and submit their classifiers so um yeah so i thankfully to the uh development of internet and uh, um um like a lot of resources to connect with people uh, electronically online. We didn't like face any difficulties in that way, in that sense. 
yet. Um, they sometimes they find us through. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel that uh, we would post our projects on. So sometimes they find us through the YouTube channel. So sometimes um, they uh, find out about us from academic Twitter. So they reach out to us by email, and uh, sometimes they upload their slides to our website, and we would be able to reach out to them in that means. So we haven't. Uh, um, encountered any difficulties and um, if you meant by like submitting their local slides sometimes they need to um, uh, submit an REB specific to their institution so that may be a little time consuming on their side but uh, overall there aren't that many difficulties in that sense thank you again are there any other questions If not, uh, thank you again to both our presenters today uh, for presenting. Thank you.